First Presbyterian Church of Phillipsburg. We are so pleased that you are here to worship with us today. Before we look over our announcements, I would like to welcome back to the pulpit Janet Kephart, CLP, who will be leading worship twice a month for us, including the In the Life service. So we want to thank you so much for being here. And now please draw your attention to the announcements found in your bulletin. The deacons will meet Monday, March 11th, so tomorrow, at 6.30 p.m. in the parlor. Lenten luncheon and services will continue this week in Westminster Hall, Wednesday, March 13th at noon for lunch. The blood drive is on Tuesday, March 12th at Trinity United Church from 1 to 6 p.m. Please donate, it is desperately needed. The Easter flower sale is going on until March 17th. There are additional order blanks located at both entrances. You can also see one of the deacons should you have any questions. A potluck meal sponsored by the Joy of Fellowship Committee is planned for Sunday, March 17th, following the worship service. Bring your favorite food to share during a time of fellowship. Table service and beverages are provided. Uh, ovens and refrigerators will be ready to keep food hot or chilled as needed. The annual Monday Thursday and Tenebrae service will be on Thursday, March 28th at 7. That is with full communion. An Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday during Sunday school, so that's at 9.30. Uh, remember to bring a basket to collect your goodies. The Senior Choir will present the Easter cantata, Come See the Place, on Easter Sunday. Uh, save the date for the Westminster Four, who will once again be singing at the Altoona Curve baseball game. That's on May 30th. Sign-up sheets are on, up on the bulletin boards, so ask your friends, make your carpool arrangements, and mark your calendars now so that you can see the first Presbyterians for a night of fun of America's favorite pasta. Uh, the April newsletter items are due to Jill Reed or Colleen Biedorfer by March 24th. And during this time of transition, Stephen Ministries will continue to do uh, pastoral care for anyone who has a need. Um, there is a phone number and uh, the church email in there if you need that. Uh, also, the flowers today are presented to the glory of God in loving memory of Bonnie Marie Reed, that's Grandma Gone Gone to the Reed kids, and that's from the Reed family. March 8th would have been her 81st birthday. Are there any other announcements? All right, now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God gathers people from the east and the west, from north and south. We will thank God for such all embracing love. Let us praise God for all of God's wonderful works. We will worship God and tell of God's deeds with songs of praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, your steadfast love is everlasting. You have come among us in Christ Jesus to save us. In this time of worship, stir us with your spirit, O God. Awaken our joy and our reverence and our songs and our silence and our prayers and praises. For you are our God, here and everywhere, now and always. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Amen.
Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent. In three short weeks, we will celebrate. But that victory is not yet in sight, as Jesus nears the deathly darkness of Good Friday alone. So alone. The disciples did not understand what was happening. Jesus tried to teach them, to explain to them, to prepare them. Jesus knew what was already unfolding and began to say goodbye. He said goodbye by taking a basin and a towel and washing their feet, even Peter's feet, even Judas' feet. And he said, I give you an example that you also should do as I do to you. But they didn't understand. No one understood what was happening. Jesus was all alone. From the cross, he felt so alone. He cried out, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you left me alone? Oh, 
that and so you learn how to sign it all, okay? Right. You know what this is? It's a cross. It's a cross. Is this a pretty cross? Mm -hmm. Or it's just an ordinary cross? It is. What do you think about when you see a cross? You think of God. You think of God. Very good. You know, there are all kinds of crosses. There's beautiful big crosses like that one up there. There are ugly crosses like that one up there. Sorry. <laughs> what I want, I want to give you this. You can wear it. A lot of people wear it. A lot of people wear them for different reasons. I wear one simply because there are times when I need it to be reminded that Jesus loves me. Not just the song that we sing to bring you children forward. That cross symbolizes Jesus loves me. So I would like that you can wear it, or you can hang it up someplace where you can look at it. But I'm hoping that every time you see a cross, no matter where it is, whether it's made out of two sticks, or whether it's silver or gold, made out of diamonds, Remember, Jesus loves you just as you are, where you are, warts and all. And I have a cross at home. You do have a cross at home? Mm -hmm. Every time you look at that now, you can remember Jesus loves you more than anybody or anything else in the whole world. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let's have a little prayer. Loving Father, we give you thanks that you do love us wherever we are and whatever we're doing. We ask that you bless these children throughout the world and bless us as your servants. Help us to remember that we are loved both now and always. Amen. Which of anyone you would like to give a cross to? Um, you can see any lights. You want to give them the lights? Anyone else you might want to give a cross to? Um, There's a little one back there, too. Can you have all the ones given to you? Okay. There's a couple more up there if anybody would like them. You can come up and help yourself. Our Old Testament reading comes from Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Hear the word of God. They traveled from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea to go around the Oman, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who has bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. May God bless this reading of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God of light and truth, speak to us through the scriptures this day. By the Spirit working in us and among us, Lead us to encounter your living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gospel on a pole. Well, you know what that is, don't you? It's referring to what's mentioned here in your Old Testament reading. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of God must be lifted up, and everyone who believes may have eternal life. So that's
that's kind of like a story hanging on a pole. Both the Old and the New Testaments say that God lifts up on the pole. Do you have any use of this mic? The, the pulpit mic would be better, probably. The pulpit mic? I'm glad you're so patient with us. We are imperfect, but we persevere and keep on going. Okay. Israel was brought up out of Egypt, and they're wandering around in the wilderness. And as we are all sometimes doing, they were grumbling and complaining. They were grumbling against, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this horrible food. And they were complaining that they would rather go back into slavery than to be in the wilderness working their way through to the promised land. They were sick of these meals already. And they didn't like them anymore. Every day, on the menu, manna. It was manna toast, manna waffles, manna burgers, manna bread. Then, same old, same old, they didn't like it anymore. And so they complained. They forgot that that manna was sent to them from heaven and that God was providing for them. And they grumbled and they complained. Do you know, they were grumbling to Moses, but Moses was a servant of God doing what God asked him to do. So they weren't just arguing and grumbling at Moses, they were arguing and grumbling at God. How about us? Do we ever mumble and grumble and complain about how hard we have it? About how God doesn't give us everything we want? Do we ever complain about we're not where we want to be, when we want to be there? I want a new house, I want a new car, I need new clothes. Why isn't God giving me all of these things? We are no better than the Israelites when we do these things. And it's a lack of trust in God. You know, sometimes we feel like God's holding out on us. And this goes back a long way, way before the Israelites were wandering around in the wilderness. This goes back to the first parents, Adam and Eve. They thought that God was holding out on him, on them. Because God said, you can have everything here except the fruit of this one tree. And that old serpent came a-flying or floating and around and around and around. And he convinced them that they, had to, they could doubt God's word and doubt his goodness to them. And you know how that turned out. Adam and Eve fell into sin. And with that sin came the curse of death. And the rest is history. We've all been doing the same thing ever since. The Lord had taken the Israelites to be his own people. He had taken them to himself. 
but they failed to trust in God. And they fell into sin. And with sin comes death. God sent poisonous snakes. And these poisonous snakes bit the people and they began to die. You notice the same thing here is the snakes to the Israelites and the snake in the Garden of Eden. Kind of goes together, doesn't it? He's drawing this connection between sin and death. And the sin is failing to trust God. And it's the consequences of death that is the result of this lack of trust in God. And that is all you and I would have to look forward to if that was the end of the story. We are all sinners. We grumble, we moan, we complain against God. There is, thank God, more to the story. And that story is hanging on a pole. Judgment and punishment and condemnation. As just and as well deserved as that judgment is, is not all there is to the story. There is God's unmerited mercy, grace, and love. And out of that great love, God provided a way for us, a way of salvation. And he hung it on a pole or he hung it on a stick. So the Lord said to Moses, everyone who is bitten can look at that snake on the stick and live. That became their way of healing. He provided this for them. Just to look at it. They could receive the salvation of the Lord. And it was his mercy that gave it to them. And that is a comparison that Jesus makes. The Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes him in him will have eternal life. What happened with that snake on a pole is replayed in even a greater fashion. Jesus himself must be lifted up as the means of even greater salvation. This story is hanging on a pole. The whole world not just the children of Israel, but the whole world, including us. We were sick, and we were dying. And as we lay there grumbling against God, doubting his goodness, shaking our fists at him for not giving us what we want, and that is the world's natural state. That's our lost condition. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, in his rich mercy and love, provided the way of salvation. Just as that bronze snake, the very sign of sin and death that was killing those folks, became the very means of their healing. So it's the same way Jesus Christ took the sin that was killing us. He embodied it. He took it all on himself. He himself 
bore our sins in and on his body on that tree. Peter says it even more starkly. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become righteousness of God. Jesus became sin for us, not for himself. He literally took it all. And by his being lifted up, and when we think of lifting up most of the time, we're, we're thinking of being held in glory and being exalted and being highly honored, but not here. When Jesus says of himself, the Son of Man must be lifted up, he's talking about himself being lifted up on that cross, being lifted up in shame and humiliation, and being lifted up to die. Christ is glorified precisely by his dying on that cross. Christ is lifted up, and consequently, God's grace and mercy and love are also lifted up. They're hoisted in the air on the tree of that cross. The story is hanging on a pole, on a stick, on a tree. My dear friends, Look to that stick, that pole. Look to that cross for your own healing. This is where your hope is. Christ hanging on the cross. Christ has promised salvation. The salvation of the whole world. Look to Jesus, your crucified Savior in faith. This is what it is to believe. You know, this is no great work you are doing. This is no new demand. You make the decision for Jesus. And it's all up to you. Faith is simply receiving the gifts that God gives. Even your faith is part of the gift. Being saved by grace through faith. This thing all comes from God. And I know we stiff-necked Presbyterians don't talk much about being saved. We do talk about salvation, and it is the same. God is offering you salvation. And it's receiving freely what God has given you. We were helpless, hopeless, and dead. And we were by nature children of wrath. But God made us alive together with Christ. Faith, believing, is simply receiving and accepting. Look in faith to that pole, to that stick to that cross where your Savior is lifted up. And he is lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is more than a snake bite you're being cured of. You're being given eternal life. 
It is life that will be characterized in ages to come. When Christ returns in glory and leads his people home, and that home is the promised land of the kingdom of heaven, with God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. And that is the gospel hanging on a pole. Jesus was lifted up on the cross for you and for me and for all the snake bite sinners of the world. Look to him and look to Jesus in faith and be saved. Believe in his name and you will have eternal life. It is this gospel on the pole that will lift you up all the way to heaven. And as I told the children this morning, every time you see that cross, or you wear a cross around your neck, or you see a cross out along a highway where unfortunately someone has passed away in a horrible accident. When you look at that cross, remember that Jesus loves you. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. Believe in him. Take him into your heart and into your life. And you will be lifted up all the way to heaven. All that glory goes to God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
is essential in the life of a Christian. Every day. A couple of times a day. A couple of thousand times a day some days. God calls us to gather together to pray for one another. And this is a time in our worship now that we gather together to pray and to share our joys and our concerns. I have one joy or one concern here. Is Mike Pellon is in need of prayer? I don't know how all of you feel about the news, but I don't like it very much. The last couple of days have been rather horrific in the world. Please keep the children and the families of the children in Mozambique in your prayers. Over 200 young girls, young women, have been taken captive by terrorists. Please, our world is in such a state. We need prayer, and we need everyone to be in prayer. What's going on right now in Israel and in Gaza, lives are being lost. Families are starving to death. Have you ever been so hungry that you thought your stomach was eating the backbone? Starvation is not an easy day. Please, please be in prayer for these people. Be in prayer that God will come in and do something and help. And be in prayer as to what you can do if there is anything you can do, do it. We need prayers. Not just occasionally. We need prayer constantly. Are there any joys or concerns that you have that you would share with one another to help in prayer? have no concerns other than what's on your heart. What about some joys? There have got to be some joys in this room because life in itself is a joy. Okay, CJ came home for a day. That is a joy. <laughs> That's it, folks. Do me a favor. I won't be here for another uh, month or so. In between time, will you start looking for some joys in your life? With all the terrible things going on in the world, there are still joys. They're sometimes harder to find, but please, let's start looking for some joy in your life. Jesus loves you. Isn't that a joy? Let us gather our hearts together and let us pray. Almighty and loving Father, you have called us together as a people to be the church of Jesus here on earth. We ask that you keep our minds and our hearts open to your word and your ways so that the world may see in us compassion and wisdom in action. May our lives Lead others to believe you are loved and live by your truth. We do give you thanks for the wonders of the world that surround us and the promise of new life stirring. And we pray for the earth and its vulnerabilities. 
loving Father, you gave us a perfect world. And it is not so perfect anymore. We ask, O oh, loving Father, that you soften the hearts of these terrorists that are going around the world, kidnapping, murdering, injuring people that are nothing to them except numbers and bodies. Soften their hearts, O oh, loving Father. And as the world looks to relieve the famine in the world, not just in Gaza and Israel, but all over the world in Africa, our loving Father, help us. Show us the way. What can we do to provide help? Help those who are distributing these supplies. Help them get them out to the people that need them the most. And be with them. Not only can they see or feel your presence, but know that you are with them. Speak to the hearts of people everywhere, and especially to those who occupy places of power. Teach us how to seek peace not only in the earth, not only in this world, but in our own neighborhoods, in our own lives. We remember the regions that are in conflict and pray that a resolution will soon come. May all who claim your name be known as the makers of peace. And we pray for those who are caught up, who find it difficult to sustain themselves day by day. We have a prayer list, and not only in this church, O loving Father, but in all the churches, their prayer lists are long, and we don't know them all. We don't know their needs, but you do. And we ask that according to your will, all of your children's needs will be met, whatever they are. And that you bring comfort and peace and strength. And give us what we need, that we may live faithfully and encourage each other. O oh, loving Lord God, we need your presence in our lives. We need your presence for the burdens that we carry in our hearts. We lift them up and we lay them before your throne of grace and mercy. And we ask now that you listen and hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not
Consider what the gift of his mercy and grace means to you. Let your offering express your thanksgiving for such an amazing gift from God. Let us receive our tithes and offerings. Bless the world with the same hope and healing we have found in you. And let us not count the cost until we have given all we can for your sake. Amen.
our Lenten journey, remember the words from the Ephesians, live as children of light. The fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So may the light of God's love surround you, the light of Christ's mercy renew you, and the light of the Spirit's wisdom guide you. And may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit abide with you now and always. Amen. Amen.